you know, depending on how you look at it, you may or may not want to visit the friendliest town. Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I am Chris Gore. Hope you're having a good day today. You know that I like to bring you documentaries that you need to put on your radar, ones that you need to see in the future, ones that you need to add to your documentary binge watching queue. Yes, I have one. Uh, and I'm fortunate today to talk to the director of The Friendliest Town, Stephen Janis. Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. How are you doing today, Stephen? Hey, Chris. Great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, this documentary is uh, could not be more timely. Um, it's a documentary about a sheriff from a small town who kind of was brought in the community, loved him, mm -hmm. and for some reason the powers that be did not. It almost it almost like the true story of this. As I was watching it, I felt like this is a thriller, like you know, mm -hmm. on HBO that you would see and it'd be like, this is wild, all these like accusations and things being uncovered and really the abuse of power at the highest levels of a small town, which is odd to say, but how did you come to the to the subject matter? Well, you know, I'm a reporter in Baltimore uh, and I'm an investigative reporter in Baltimore City. So I've been covering policing for most of my career. As, as you may or may not know, or people may or may not know, Baltimore City has one of the most corrupt police departments probably in the world. I don't think that's an exaggeration. We just had a scandal with the Gun Trace Task Force, which was eight or nine officers who dealt drugs and uh, stole drugs, dealt drugs, robbed residents. So so I was became friends with a homicide detective named Kelvin Sewell, who really became disgusted with policing here. So he decided to move to this small sort of uh, town on the lower eastern shore of Maryland, which is sort of down a peninsula by the Chesapeake Bay, and sort of get away from all of it and kind of reconfigure policing and, and go with a community policing strategy and thought, hey, you know, I found this small town. Um, I'm going to become a small town cop, do all the things that I would, would have wanted to do that I couldn't do in Baltimore City and get away from all the crime and corruption of the city police department. And, and you know, what ensued, as you said, is almost like you know a dead of night scenario where he ends up becoming you know a target of law enforcement. So it, it really was you know a, a, in a sense a, a really tragic story, but also really a stunning story because everything he did to kind of transform policing turned back on him and kind of showed how law enforcement, especially in places like Maryland, is entrenched and entrenched against the idea of community policing. I mean, they they effectively drove him out of town with these. Um frivolous charges, these yeah. charges that were on the face of it. And what's so funny is, is I watched you, you're in the doc, you really become part of the, yeah. you know, part of this whole battle. In addition to a, um, I'm not familiar with the outlet, but like a, a sort of a citizens reporter group, I feel like that's becoming, what was the woman's name? My, my apologies. Um, she's, oh, she's covering the event. The, the Citizens for a Better Pokemon is what you were talking about? Citizens for a Better Pokemon or? No, the citizen reporter that you interact with in oh. the film. Um, she's recurring. Oh, oh, with who? With she's rec she's recurring throughout the documentary with you. And Taya Graham, the. Uh... Yeah, yeah. She's, she, and I feel like more and more citizen journalism will yeah. become more prevalent and as I remember hearing like what the charges were, these yeah. trumped up charges against Kevin Sewell, I'm thinking like, this is nothing. What is this? Like it's it's yeah. it sounded utterly ridiculous. And this idea of the sort of more involved in the community policing just seems like a better idea on its face. I mean, if we yeah. if we trust the police, we're more likely to come to them, trust them and, and to solve issues. Yeah, well, here's the thing. I mean, what what Kelvin Sewell did when he came down, just to give some background, is he he decided he was going to you know change policing in this community, which had been sort of subject to the war on drugs kind of policing, which is where you have like specialized units come into a town, arrest a bunch of people, and then roll out. and And he came in and said, "I'm going to do community policing. My my officers are going to get out of the car and they're going to walk in the community." And it really transformed the relationship with policing. And and when he got fired. Um, by the council for reasons that they would not disclose. Uh, you know, that's when this whole background investigation started. And 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 what happened was they basically went through everything they had ever done and sort of tried to find something. You know, it's sort of the antithesis of what we would hope a justice system would be 
like and how justice would be sort of carried out in the sense that they went, you know, talked to everything, won everything he'd ever done, and finally settled on this accident that had occurred three years before where, you know, Kelvin had, had shown up in an accident scene and simply asked the cop to investigate it, and they concluded it was just an accident. And so really, in the parlance of police corruption that we see in, in across the country, this is the opposite story. That's what's so, I think, frustrating and illustrative about it, because he he really um, you know, tried to change that relationship. And what ends up happening, as you point out, and what's really scary, is they really like just went through his entire life, his entire career down there, and just finally dug something up and prosecuted him, not once, but twice for the same crime. So it, it, it's kind of scary, and it also sort of says, you know, what sometimes what law enforcement is all about, especially in African-American communities. It, it, it just seemed like, I, I mean, I, I guess um, the part of the story that is inspiring and lightning and, mm -hmm. and at least hopeful is the fact that the community was so behind Kelvin, like he, that you could, you, you know, you interview some citizens and, uh, you know, and, and they talk about like their relationship with, uh, I don't think that you see that a lot. I mean, um, I, I, so at least that that was heartening. And I think what it did is it, I, I, at least from what I saw, is it galvanized the community to like, oh, yeah. we have to now pay attention. We yeah. have to get involved. We can't just sit there and complain. We have to get elected to office so that we can actually do something. Is that is that at least the positive? I mean, you know, his in a way, his career was ruined. But from yeah. those ashes has come a more involved public. Um, that is absolutely why this story to me was worth following. It wasn't just about the fall of a cop or a cop who got caught up in a corrupt system. But, you know, you saw the, 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 all the residents there, the residents who supported Chief Sewell, um, the African-American community banded together, formed the Citizens for a Better Pokemoke, started running candidates that they supported, started door knocking. Um, and then showing up at council meetings, as we documented, where they would confront the council about, you know, why did you fire him? We we had a successful policing, you know, strategy here in Pokemon. Crime was down. Why did you fire him? And I think you're right. That's the great takeaway is that from that, you know, I think really tragic action by the council and from, you know, the racism that was revealed, uh, this group became a political force in the town and really transformed the town because, you know, not to give it away, but at the end, you'll see that there was some significant change. And that was all because people of the town, you know, got together and said, you know, we're not going to stand for this anymore. And we're going to raise our political consciousness. So yeah, there is like a really heartwarming and at least one positive aspect that it did sort of, you know, prompt a town and prompt the people in the town to say, hey, like you said, we're not going to take this anymore. We're going to show up at council meetings. We're going to demand, you know, that our concerns be heard. And then we're going to organize, which I think was even more sort of heartwarming was to see people organize and say, we can change this if we organize. And, and I think to a certain extent, you know, when we see the police protests and protests about policing, what this story shows is that, you know, there's a type of activism, activism that can lead to constructive change, which is what happened here. It wasn't just about protesting, but really getting together and saying, you know what, we're gonna change the system from the ground up and we're gonna make our voices be heard because we're gonna vote and we're gonna put our candidates out there. So yeah, th this is really in a sense, uh, it's it's a mixed story, you know. It's a tragic story of one man's like really, you know, uh, career being destroyed and his per and his reputation being ruined, but also a community awakening. Yeah, I I, I think it's just um, and you could not have if you were doing the narrative feature version of this documentary, you probably couldn't cast anyone better than this city council. These members, where you're just, I mean, they really kind of fit the cliche of the type of person that acts in a corrupt way. I mean, um, just, I mean, I just thought that was funny, but but like uh, what what what's interesting is it just shows the arrogance of certain elected officials that feel that they're not beholden to the people. Yeah. And, I, and, and at least what I got from this is that you have to pay attention. You cannot mm -hmm. allow this sort of rampant arrogance and corruption um, just run rampant. You you can't. You have to get involved. I I feel like it's up to all of us to do our civic duty and at the very least pay attention. Point out you know things that are an outrage like this 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 frivolous case 
and then do something about it. It is it is heartwarming it, it, to see how the film ends. Again, yeah. I'm glad you didn't ruin it. But like, right. there's uh, just to see like this citizens rise up in a way that I think is the right way to do it, which mm -hmm. is to get involved and get in a position where you can actually do something. Yeah, right? right. And I mean, you know, it's it's we never think about this, but really, there's so much power in these small towns, in the council, in the police department. Um, you know, we all think about national politics and we got to vote for president, which of course is very important. But in towns like Pocomo, you know, the, the thing that really impacts people's lives are these small towns. And a lot of people wield this power in a way that, it, as you point out, disregards the people. And, and I think that was the flashpoint in this film was the people saying, wait a second, we don't like these policies. We finally had a chief who cared about us and didn't treat us like you know, a, a community to be monetized by arrest, but rather a person who would walk, walk the streets and get to know us and treat us like human beings. And, and the thing is, and I think it's very important to make this point, that type of policing worked. I mean, the crime in Pocomoke went down. They didn't have a homicide for four or five years. The, the fact that the officers are willing to connect with the people worked. And, and the fact that the leaders in the town fired him and then wouldn't say why they did it, you know, no matter how many, you know, it's it's well documented in the film how many times people in the council, people from Citizens for a Better Pokemon show up at council and say, why did you fire him? Why did you let him go? You know, just asking a very simple question, which should be answered to the public, which is, I think the public has a right to know, and they wouldn't answer it. And that, I think I agree with you, is the height of arrogance. I mean, really, what we all expect from our, our public officials is basic transparency. And in this case, in Pokemon, they're like, we don't have to answer you because we've never had to answer you in the past. And, you know, part of that has to do with the racism. The Eastern Shore, you know, is, is like sometimes going back in time. It's, it's, it's a small um, peninsula, part of Maryland. It, it goes out into the Chesapeake Bay. And, um, you know, you kind of cross over what's known as the Bay Bridge and suddenly you're transformed into a different landscape. But, you know, they, you are absolutely right. They really were intransigent about saying, I'm not going to answer a very simple and basic question. And I think that really shows that power, even on a local level, can be wielded in ways that is quite offensive to the people. Fortunately, the people in the South, you know, had had the wherewithal to rise up and really force some change. Well, uh, I, I I thought it was uh, inspirational, and I, I you know it was sort of weird seeing this town that seemed kind of stuck in a different era. Yeah. But it did it did seem kind of stuck yeah. in a completely different era. But but you know, change is possible. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen, thank you for talking to us on the yep. Film Threat Podcast. I want to thank our sponsor, Storyblocks. Go to storyblocks.com slash film threat. They support the Film Threat Podcast so we can tell you about documentary films like The Friendliest Town, which is, I'm going to guess by the time this runs, it's available for pre-order on iTunes. Yeah. Um, and you'll be able to get it on all video on demand yes. platforms. Absolutely. So is there a website, Stephen, too, people can go well, to? You can go to uh, friend, The Friendliest Town on Facebook or Eyes on Police on Twitter. Um, both of them, you know, you can get more information, uh, the friendliest town on Facebook, you know, at the friendliest town, uh, any information on the film and, you know, where it will be released and where it'll be available. We'll all be there. Awesome. Uh, Steven, thank you for talking to us on the film yeah. podcast. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Take care.